Back in 1948 in Binghamton, New York, where I eventually went to college, this is a comic book burning where librarians, PTA groups, um, encouraged children to bring all their comic books together for a giant auto de fe. Um, the kind of comic books they were upset about were things like this one. They looked at this and saw uh, comic books as the cause of juvenile delinquency, crime, and the end of civilization. Um, you know, comic books at the time were sort of like the uh, Grand Theft Auto of their day. <laughs> I look at it and I see a perfect metaphor for comics, you know, because comics basically have been able to get past the critical radar and go directly into the brain through the eye. And they get there because the brain works the way comics work. We um, think in little bursts of language, maybe the number of words that could fit into uh, a speech balloon. And we think in iconic imagery and uh, abstracted art, you know, like I read somewhere that a baby in the crib can recognize one of those smiley faces, a have a nice day face, before they can recognize their mother smiling. So we're wired to understand this combination of uh, icons and little bursts of language. So I just had this folly of a notion that maybe comics were capable of being whatever, more than just escapist entertainment. Maybe they could be some kind of art. Now, when I think of art and comics, I don't mean this. Um, basically, Roy Lichtenstein found a way out of the cul-de-sac of abstract expressionism, by where you couldn't draw pictures anymore, just black on black, drips of paint, and so on. And artists hunger to draw, humans hunger to make uh, recognizable images. And so, by making a drawing of a drawing, he was able to climb onto the back of comics and make uh, a way back to figurative drawing. Uh, the problem was, it was very condescending. You know, the whole thing here is about, ah, uh, industrialized society with its red dots instead of plush Rubenesque skin tones, the inexpressive rubbery lines uh, of Erzat's mass culture emotion. Um, so, basically, I can't help it, I still bear a big grudge against um, Lichtenstein. I feel he did no more for comics than Andy Warhol did for soup. <laughs> and yet, I've always felt like uh, this picture that I made quite a few years back. Comics as a means of self-expression, oh John, you're such a fool, I, I'm sorry. Because for me what's interesting is where two pictures butt up against each other, where things leak out and uh, make something collaged and new. Um, so to start, maybe I should give you a definition of comics. This is a lot briefer than um, Scott McCloud's Understanding Comics and some of you may have read. Um, like this is from the American Heritage Dictionary, and you get this definition of comics in one line and a lot of other definitions for the same price. And any dictionary cool enough to use Nancy for the definition of comics has got to have it right, the way I figure. It just says that uh, Comics are a narrative series of cartoons. Okay, we'll work with that. But mainly, let me tell you about Nancy here, because Nancy really is virtually the definition of comics. In that, um, in its heyday, it was the most read comic strip in the world. It wasn't the most popular. It's just that it was a lot more work to not read Nancy. <laughs> so, like, for instance, here, this narrative series of cartoons. So. Nancy is going into a silhouette shop. She's going in because she's going from, sorry, let me learn my gadget here. Um, okay. Nancy's going into a silhouette, I kept thinking the projector would go out, but not my little light. Okay. Um, it, and she's going in because she's going from right to left and we read from left to right and one reads comics. So she's going into a silhouette shop. You know it's a silhouette shop because you've got the word silhouettes up there and then these kind of uh, black silhouettes below so you get the information twice, it hammers you and you know it. Then the second panel, she's going out of the silhouette shop and um, you don't have to have another one of these back there, do you? Cool. You don't have a cigarette, do you? Um, uh, uh, bear with me while I overcome some technical difficulties like learning how to turn on a light. Okay. Um, <laughs> This doesn't look like me. Okay, so now you don't see the silhouette shop anymore because you saw it in the panel before, you don't need it, and she's going left to right, so she's coming out. And you can focus just on her grousing about how it doesn't look like her. And then she goes under a uh, scaffold. 
The scaffold is just three and a half feet high, just high enough to be known as a scaffold. And this bucket of paint is about to fall on her. You know that it's about to fall because it's about 45 degrees, and here's what it looks like when it's not falling. Okay. And then now, it looks like her, you get it? It's so, you get it? Yes. Okay, now, this combination of like, simple signs allows profound things to happen. When I was looking at that definition, I looked up the word cartoons, because it was much harder to waste time before Google. Um, so, narrative series of cartoons, you look up cartoons and you find out it doesn't necessarily mean a funny drawing, it's just the uh, rough sketch for a mural. So, that kind of um, small shorthand version is what a cartoon might be. And then, what, where it got really interesting was looking up the word narrative. And uh, this is where you writing majors can pay attention. Because, see, it turns out that narrative comes from the medieval, uh, from the word story. Is it, I'm sorry, narrative means story. And story comes from the medieval Latin historia. Uh, it refers very specifically to the story, the, the one that was told um, in churches and windows going across one floor of a church, let's say, which is where we get the word story as the stories of a building. And it was telling you basically about that early superhero who could walk on water and turn it into wine. And um, it was before they had newsprint. And as a result, I realized that there's a kind of uh, deep connection between narrative and structure, and very specifically with comics. That was how I learned to understand what a page is. Like here, in a gasoline alley Sunday page, um, you have an empty lot with the characters inside. The whole page is one large scene with the characters still moving from panel to panel, right? That's uh, a structured page. And then the next week, they're beginning to build the building. And then seven days later, the building is pretty much built, and they continue to play. This is narrative to me. This is about uh, things holding together. And it's how I understood what I, my project was. Like here in the very beginning of uh, one chapter of Mouse, Vladek is uh, on an exercise on an inset window, and you're looking in through a window to see the people that are still living in this household in 1940 before they're sent to a ghetto. And in the efficiency of comics, where you have to use little bursts of language and simple pictures, I have to introduce you to the characters that were living in that house. So after you've met them through this window, I slow down enough to let you know who the people are in this other grid that echoes that window. And it's a very architectural way of making something known. Uh, similarly, um, when I was working on the strips about September 11th, in the shadow of no towers, uh, based on that day where we outran the tumbling building behind us, um, in these large broadsheet sized pages, you read across then you have a panel up there that says something like, uh, it's the first one, and it says, synopsis, as you may remember in our last episode, the world ended. <laughs> then you get to kind of probably follow the burning bones of the buildings down and off stage. And then you scramble back to find out where to read next. Maybe to the towers over here, maybe this sequence, maybe this, waiting for that other shoe to drop. It's disorienting, because you're supposed to be able to like be guided through the page. It's part of the cartoonist's job as a, uh, somebody structuring his narrative. But this was about tumbling structures. I was inspired by things like this old Batman page. Because, see, when cartoonists were in a hurry or did a bum job, they would, like, have these arrows to keep you going the right way. Because otherwise, you, you, like Robin and Batman, fall down an elevator shaft and die. But if you follow the arrows, you're saved. And that led to... Uh, a series of strips I was making when I was genuinely deeply interested in Mad Magazine and structure. I did a page called Day at the Circuits, uh, in which you got like lots of comics on one page. Um, you could follow the arrows around. So, like that, this stuff shows you how, how to follow them around. I only drink to keep from getting so damn depressed. Ah, things ain't so bad. What's got you down? I'm depressed because I drink so much. It's destroying my liver. Well, why don't you just quit drinking? I only drink to keep from getting so damn depressed. Don't talk in circles. Please, don't shout. It depresses me, and I only drink to keep from getting so damn depressed. <laughs> ah, things ain't so bad. What's got you down? I'm depressed because I drink so much, it's destroying my liver. But maybe another you know, drink will cheer me up. Hey, let's get out of this dump. There's a swell joint right down the street. No U-turns. 
Um, well, have a seat. I know the bartender at this place personally. How do you like it? It's a dump. All these stupid dumps look alike. Please, don't shout. It depresses me. And I only drink to keep from getting so damn depressed. Ah, things ain't so bad. What's got you down? I'm depressed because I drink so much. It's destroying my liver. Well, why don't you just slash your wrists? Dead end. Start again. So, for me it was all about ending the page somewhere in the middle.